So a very good morning, everybody. And special thanks to Michelle for giving me this opportunity to address such a nice gathering with so many luminaries. So I'll be talking on zero. Uh, you know, the general psyche of uh, Indian common folk, educated common folk, as I have been watching last 10, 15 years, if uh, you ask anybody about zero, they seem to know that India invented zero. And more or less that's what they know. I mean, what does it mean to say that somebody invented zero? What was it before it was invented? And it was not invented in a laboratory, neither it was excavated. So what, what sort of invention is it? This is uh, generally missing in, in my peers, I mean in the mathematical circle, as well as in the common educated folk. But what they seem to know, some of them, I mean many of them, is who invented zero, which is something very puzzling. I mean historians are not very comfortable telling the name, but they seem to know. So allow me to begin on a lighter note after a series of very intense lectures yesterday. So I'd like to share with you this popular joke to begin with in social media. The one day Aryabhata asked his wife, will you allow me to spend the night out with my friends? And she replied, according to your calculation, what is the probability of my given consent to this? And it is then Aryabhata invented zero. I mean, light as it may seem, this talks about the general awareness about zero in Indian common folk. So this is a difficult problem. I mean, who actually then invented zero, where, how? I mean, answer to this question unfortunately cannot be given in one single sentence. It mainly depends on what you understand by the word zero, its connotation from various different perspectives. Now today, uh, it's not possible to touch upon all these issues. Believe me, experts know, for the student friends, each of these issues can be addressed for hours. And today I have only, uh, I mean, less than that for the whole issue. So I'll touch upon one, of, uh, one or two of them, and that too in a very sketchy manner, uh, allow me to do that. It will be sort of nutshell approach, touching upon certain issues, not uh, having scope to elaborate them. We can discuss after, if you are interested. So we'll touch upon uh, basically the last three issues, where did it, uh, it get the present name zero, and why this Indian zero. From my perspective as a student of mathematics, I think uh, the very important thing about this Indian aspect of zero is uh, its mathematical nature, the nature as a number in its own right. It did bloom in various, several other societies, ancient civilizations, as we'll try to touch upon, but uh, nowhere else it bloomed to the full potential of the modern number zero that we are using. That's the speciality of the Indian zero, and one must clearly understand these subtle differences. Okay, so we start with uh, one or two such uh, accolades given to this uh, great invention. I mean, there are many. I have chosen these two. Being a student of mathematics, I find this, uh, okay, it should be, yeah. So you see here, Laplace tells that ingenious method of expressing every possible number using a set of 10 symbols. Now that's important, 10 symbols, I mean all of them, from one to zero are given the same footing, that is very important. And the symbols having a place value and absolute value. So to understand the significance of zero, one has to first understand the significance of a place value system unless you have a place value system in operation, and we are talking about in particular decimal place value system, you don't actually require zero. I mean, if you say 202, you, you don't need zero to utter it in language. That is another aspect of it. Until it comes down to writing, you don't need zero. So these uh, aspects are to be uh, clearly and categorically stated and understood. And uh, here he says the importance of this invention is more readily appreciated when one considers that it was beyond the two greatest men of antiquity. We'll come to that if time permits. And then Burbaki, a pseudonym of a group of eminent mathematicians, they mentions that actually this decimal system by the agency of Arabs, uh, it's derived from Hindu mathematics, where its use is attested already from the first uh, centuries of our era. And this zero as a number and not as a simple symbol of separation. I mean, that's another very important subtlety that you must appreciate that when you talk about 101 in writing, you write 101 or you write 100001, 
this roll of zero is called a placeholder zero. And when you think of zero as two minus two is equal to zero, that's the number in its own right. That's the two completely different aspects the zero is playing. So this second aspect is mathematically absolutely important. And its uh, introduction into calculation also count among the original contribution of the Hindus. Okay, so I'll start with this uh, genesis of the word zero from uh, the word shunya as it is generally believed that it, uh, again, it's a long, long journey. I'll just touch upon certain important cornerstones to start with this word shunya from Sanskrit, which is coming from this derivation, sunayat, and comes from the shi, the root, which means to swell or to grow, and therefore, from semantic extension, the idea of hollowness, and found this uh, word, uh, re related word in uh, Rig Veda, implying lack or absence, lack of suns in this reference. But physically, I mean, uh, grammatically, it may mean something only in the negative sense, absence or nothingness. Philosophically, in ancient India, it was attributed many other dimensions. The most common uh, synonym the Indian mathematicians used was this word kha, which comes from the root khan, which means to dig. So if you dig, what you get in a three-dimensional way is a sort of thing called randhra, hole, as an, another synonym used for kha. Do such a thing in a two-dimensional surface, what you get is a puncture mark, chidra, that again is a common synonym. And all these synonyms were used is another word for kha is the vast expanse of the sky and the limitlessness of the sky. Therefore, it also invited this kind of uh, akasha, ambara, and therefrom the idea of purna, the completeness. These are all and many more. These are called vuta shankha. I'll come to that later. So these were used simultaneously, sort of a dichotomy between nothingness, uh, vacuity of zero, and everything, completeness. Right? Philosophically. But uh, if, you, if you look at the lexicon, Amar Kosh uh, by Amar Shingha, the grammatical meaning was this, shunnam tu vashikam tuchyo riktake, tuchyo vashikam, this void or emptiness, trifling, emptied or devoid of. So when, at a point of time in history, this was, uh, this gone to the Arabs in the court of uh, Khalif al-Mamun in Baghdad, there's a Bayat al-Hikmah, house of wisdom, and they translated this uh, term according to their understanding of Sanskrit, which was possibly only grammatical. So they uh, coined the word sifra, which means basically nothing. I mean, only the negative sense of vacuity was translated. The other philosophical thing got, uh, I mean, left behind. And this uh, later on uh, keeps on changing. And at a point of time, again, in 1202 is another very important cornerstone. We find this word zephyrum in the work, work of Fibonacci. Uh, the son of Bonacci, Bonaccio, and the Italian uh, a traveler, trader. This uh, son, later on, he became a mathematician. Leonardo of Pisa, his actual name. And when he has written the book Liber Abaci in 1202, the book of numbers, he coined the word Zephyrum, mild west wind. For his geographical location in Italy, he thought when he learned it from the Moorish Arabs in the eastern coast of Africa, so he thought it came from the Arabs, and according to his geographical location, he called it West Wind. And this name later on changed gradually to Italian Zephyro, and then in the Venetian dialect, it became Zero and French, and then English Zero and Zero in French. Similar words coming from Sifra, there are so many related to digits or numbers, and this also led to this English word Cipher, telling a very interesting story that at a point of time in Europe, this uh, zero and the mathematics related to zero, the decimal system, was to be secretly done because charge was against it. it was, there's a ban for using these kind of things because primarily it was thought to be coming from Muslims, so anti-charge and hence this has to be banned. Also there are other reasons provided that these numerals are not very steady, they can be very easily forged, six can be made, nine and so on and on. So this is a long story. So, well, what I don't want to tell is this, it doesn't mean that after this uh, time and only this, uh, this uh, idea of zero was transmitted to Europe, there is a long gap, but this gap was not actually, there were many other players, I mean, some of them, I'll just again point out, the first reference we get is of the Syrian monk in 662, he is clearly telling that I shall not now speak of the knowledge of the Hindus. 
of their method of calculation which no one can praise strongly enough. I mean the system using the nine symbols. Now you see a very significant thing again, nine symbols, the ten, tenth one is not formally being referred, but tenth one was there without that absence, the tenth, the placeholder, you cannot have a decimal system with nine symbols only. But there is a, you know, sort of skeptic or sort of uh, not putting the things in the same platform, these nine symbols and the tenth one. And there you see the next one, Monk Vigilan, in the Codex Vigilanaus in uh, Spain, in the El Escorial Museum it is kept, and there you have again nine Hindu Arabic numerals, but no zero. You can see this uh, picture over there is one to nine, but no zero over there, and this is Monk Vigilan. The Indians have an extremely subtle intelligence. The best proof of this is the nine symbols with which they represent each number, no matter however large. But this gradually died with Liber Abachi, when now he is categorically writing nine numerals, and with this a sign. So you see again, now it is being invited, but with a different status. Nine numerals and a sign zero, called Zephyram in Arab. One writes all the number one wishes. In contrast with the Roman symbol that was there, you want to write larger numbers, you need to have more and more and more symbols, no end to that, theoretically. So that, that's why this was so very highly praised that only with this many symbols you can write as many, as large a number you want to write. And then a uh, few more years again you see that this has changed to Zifra and then this is according to the Indians it means nothing and the nine figure themselves are Indian and the Zifra is written thus. So you see there is still a sort of skeptic, skeptic approach that this is a symbol, this is not in the same footing with the other numerals. Now mathematically that is, that is absolutely important. And you see, uh, the first appearance in writing, in published article, uh, in print, is uh, in Europe, is only in 1491, in this book by Philip Calendry, the Arithmetica Opusculum in uh, Latin. There you first find, and a contemporary view of charge was like this. God is omnipotent, there is nothing. I mean, they're equating nothing with zero. So there is nothing God cannot do. But God being ultimate goodness cannot do evil. So evil is nothing. So God cannot do evil and God can... Nothing that God can do, they're equating them, and this is Berthias, a Greco-Roman monk. So this was kind of view of charge against zero at that point of time. So it's amazing that even some modern books, we find this approach, I mean, secluding zero separately. Mathematically now we know that they lie on the same table, they lie on the same footing. Unless you accept zero as an integer, the entire mathematics will collapse. There is nothing mathematically different from one to nine and zero. You cannot call just and zero, they are one to zero. All these ten of equal footing that you require. But even in a very recent book I have seen, uh, Science in Saffron, the author Professor Mira Nanda is again and again mentioning nine symbols and zero. I don't know why zero has to be placed mathematically in the same footing. And that precisely is the role of Indian zero. That's the most important role of Indian zero in the whole story. So I'll come to that. Uh, and if you want to know the whole story of zero, this uh, gradual development, what the other uh, civilizations, sentence, ancient civilizations had, what was their counting system, was there zero? If there was zero, then why that zero was not accepted as the predecessor of a modern zero? Then you have to look through all these civilizations, which I'm afraid our time will not permit. So I'll just sketchily touch uh, some of the some of the major players, and that too in a very very nutshell manner. Excuse me, because time is uh, very very limited. So we start with Egypt. You know this is Egyptian hieroglyphics, as you can see embedded there. These are numerical symbols. If you know to read, you know that this is this leaning man is 10 to the power six, and you see these tadpoles and this. Uh, other symbols, everyone is a numerical symbol, these are tens, these are hundreds, thousands. So let me, let me try to give you this idea that this was an additive system. Additive in the sense that you write these symbols side by side and keep on adding them, much like Roman, but Roman is not purely additive, that even subtracts. You write the sign of V in Roman, V, English looking V, and write one to the side of it, it's six. Uh, you write one to the left, it's then four. So it's not purely additive, but this was purely additive. So these are four and then five uh, zeros that makes 54 and then these are 200, so this is 254, that's additive system. And in this kind of system, zero was not required. Because you keep on uh, putting more and more and more symbols, it's based on 10, but no need for a symbol of zero there. 
And uh, at a later stage, this is one of the oldest known documents of uh, human civilization, mathematical document of human civilization. They are older, of course. Rhine papyrus is one of them. You have Moscow papyrus, Reisner papyrus. But uh, here you have very interesting mathematical calculations. And in these calculations, this kind of heretic script uh, were used. And there you see they have simplified these symbols to much uh, simpler things. And this script was used with operations of addition and subtraction. They used to write sort of simple equations and solving them. They could even write fractions, but only unit fractions, having one in the numerator. And uh, at a point of time, some of the historians, uh, formally told minority view, uh, found this symbol which uh, somebody proposed uh, to be a sort of a nascent idea of zero in their entire system. But this was not a mathematical symbol per se. It was used certain time in some accounting text. Basically, this uh, Nafra means beautiful. If you remember the name Nafra Titi, beautiful girl. So that Nafra, this uh, was actually uh, used to indicate the base level of drawing of the tombs. You know, those uh, pyramids and regular flooding of Nile uh, used to, you know, destroy the burial chambers. So at a point of time, those masons or uh, those architects, they thought of making the base level higher than the ground level, and that base level is called Nafra. And from that, they used to count one cubit, two cubit upward, and one cubit, two cubit downward. So some uh, historians prefer to think that possibly there is a nascent idea of having a zero in between and then going up one, two, three, and going down one, two, three that way. But that doesn't cut uh, you know, much ice because formally in the mathematical calculations, we don't find this uh, use of this symbol except once where this was used to signify the balance of account. But that can also interpret that the balance of account was beautifully done. I mean, the debit and credit matches, so it is beautifully ending. So in that sense, this symbol was used there. So that's a tacit idea. And then we come to other one, Mesopotamian and Babylonian system. There you have the clay tablets and there you have this system which works with base 10, like our decimal system where you write one, one, two symbols of one, it stands for one into 10 plus one, that's 11. Here if you write there one side by side, two such symbols, it stands for 61, one into 60 plus one, right? And this is base, uh, base uh, system plus value system, but for this base 60 system, the basic 59 symbols were basically additive in nature, as you can see. Repeated use of the same symbol up to 9 and then is a new symbol for 10. Then 10 with 1 is 11. It goes on and on and on up to 59. So many additive symbols and they are to be put together like this one because now every place can be occupied by a symbol for 1 to 59. And that's how you write numbers. And this 60, as you can see, was written by a similar symbol like 1 but bigger in size. That was the representation of 60, the big one. And 0 in this system was left by a gap. And that was very, very confusing for about a thousand years. Because you see, if you write, see in our present system as an example, suppose you don't know zero, you write one, place a gap, and then write another one. So when I look at that, there is no way, there is no clue that I can understand how many zero you wanted to put there. Is it one zero one or one zero 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 one? It's, it's ambiguous always. So that was a very problematic issue. And this issue was resolved. Yes? It's, that's not necessary because that's the additive system. Yes, 204 is 204, so you sim put two ha symbols for 100 and then a 4. No, no, no. There's no 0 required. You see Egyptian system there. You want to write 204, so that is 200. These are 200 symbols, 100 and 100. Then you use 2000s. You use 2000s then. Right, Brahmi, additive, yes. And then, this was resolved around a point of uh, time, which is 300 BC, by some ingenious uh, Babylonian, who first proposed this sign of separation. Now this actually resolves this issue that you put this sign of separation in between two numerals, and you know how many places you want to leave as gap. So this is the uh, symbol of zero, undoubtedly. But that actually did not bloom to the fullest potential of the number zero because we didn't find that this zero was taken to operations of mathematics in mathematical numbers. Ifra had gone to length in this fantastic book that he was referred, uh, it was referred the other day, and there he has shown tablets were showing that the calculation is being done, and when there is some x minus x situation, it should be written with this kind of symbol as zero, but then it is in language that the grain is finished.
this is not being used. So it is believed that uh, though this was there, it's of course one of the oldest known form of zero, but this zero didn't play both the necessary roles of the modern zero, right? So in that sense, this is uh, not really the predecessor of our modern zero. That's the, that's the role I wanted to tell you, the placeholder zero and the number zero in its own right. That's the, that makes a hell of a lot of difference. So we'll come to the next uh, civilization, which is Mayan civilization uh, uh, in Yucatan Peninsula in the Mexico, Guatemala, Honduras region. It's one of the fantastic mathematical, arithmetical civilization. And I quote Kaplan, he says that it's as if this entire group of people, Mayans, they, they were suffering from collective arithmania. They used to calculate profusely and they used to calculate time actually because for them time was a burden carried by the God and God is to be satisfied with sacrifice and someday if God is cross and he says that I am not ready to carry your burden of time, he stops it, the world will collapse. So they used to calculate more and more and more calendars in their system and that actually needed sophisticated mathematics. And this mathematics, interestingly, gave fullest, fullest, uh, I mean, role of zero there, except one little point that I'll come to. These are anthropomorphic Mayan numerals. You can see from uh, these uh, zero to 19, these are actually 20 days of a Mayan month. Mayans had a civil calendar called Hub, where you have 18 months each of 20 days. And that makes 360, and there is an extra month for five days called Waib, a special month. So they knew that it has to be 365 from the position of the sun, uh, their observation of the sky every year. And this uh, interestingly started with the day zero, not with day one as we do now. So zero was very important for them. And uh, this uh, gradually led to their vigesimal system. So this is a sort of calligraphic presentation. These are days of month, and every month had a separate name, Zip, Zo, Zek, and so on and on. So we'll come to uh, these interesting representations. These are zero symbols of Mayans. This represents zero days. This is zero. Kin. Kin is days. So this represents zero days. These are some other symbols they used for zero, most common being this one, the shell, usually colored red. And there are more, I couldn't manage to find more, but theoretically there are more symbols of zero. And this is the commonly used vigesimal Mayan system. You see, so smart, so beautiful, using basically only two uh, different symbols, a dot and a dash, and this uh, special one, zero, zero to 19, the 20. This is a vigesimal system. They used to write from up to down, much like the Chinese system. Uh, there you have to consider one one as one into 20 plus one. That's 21, the vigesimal system. But at a point of time, this got, uh, you know, complicated. Now, how is this complication? So I have to explain that a bit mathematically. So this is interestingly the Mayan calendar. If you have it today, I mean this day, today, very, our 5th December 2017 in the Mayan calendar, long count calendar, if you write, this is the system. 13, 0, 5, 0, 10, there's 13 Baktun, 0 Katun, 5 Tun, and 0 Uinal, and 10 Kin. So this is Kin is day. And then group of 20 days is a month, that's a winal. And then group of 18 Uinal is a Tun. And that makes a difference. I'll come to that, why? And then similarly again, 20, group of 20. Everywhere you see group of 20, except in the third place, where possibly they wanted to stick to the number of days of a year as close to that as possible. Because if you put a 20 over here, this place becomes 400. And 400 is much far away than year. So they used to count days from a certain particular day, which according to them was the day zero, the beginning of the universe. They have calculated it somehow. And according to our Julian calendar, that day goes to 3114 BC, August 13. And that was the Mayan day zero. So any important event, social event, the accession of a throne for a king, they used to calculate first the total number of days that has elapsed and then subdivided it in several time units called Kin, Uinal, Tun, Katun, and Baktun. And that was pseudo vigesimal. One particular place was missing, and that actually, uh, you know, tampered the Mayan calculation. Its, its place value system was lost. One very important role of zero that it has to play in the system, a pro in tandem with a place value, is completely lost. What is that system? What is this problem? The problem is this. You see, if you have this, this uh, you can see three fives are 15, and then this is six. So I'm calculating their numbers. This is 18 into one, that's 
according to them, the second place is 20 into 18, and that's how they calculate this number to be this one. But if I actually calculate it in base 20 system, this number, 15, 6, 16, 18, should represent this number. Now, what's the problem? What's the big deal? The big deal is this, that if you have a system with modern zero in a place value nature, like you have uh, the number 11 in our system and you write a zero to the right of it, how much more is it? It's 10 times, we say always. But that's only half true. It's 10 times because I'm in a decimal system. Say I go to binary system and write 1, 1. Then in 1, 1 in binary system, that represents the number 1 into 2 plus 1 is 3. And I make it 1, 1, 0 in binary. Then it will represent 1 into 2 square plus 1 into 2 plus 0, and that makes 6. So this is actually getting multiplied by the base of the system. Right? So this will be missing in the Mayan case. When in Mayan system you write 1, 0, it's 20. When you write 1, 0, 0, it should be something else, because this should be 400. But actually, according to the Mayan long count, this becomes 360. And to write 400, you have to write 1, 2, 0. So that's not typically in tune with a decimal place value system. And that is why, in spite of giving full honor to the number 0 in its own right, Mayan zero is not generally considered as the predecessor of our modern zero. So we next come to the Greece. This is another great civilization with great thinkers, philosophers. And unfortunately, these philosophers stood the way of uh, development of the concept of zero in Greece. You know, Greece had a very uh, undeveloped system of uh, there is no different numerals. This alpha, beta, gamma were their numerals as well. To differentiate between the writings and numerals, they used to put this bar on the top of the numerical part. And they had actually 24 of them. So three of them they devised, the digamma or stigma and coppa and sampi, and made this kind of uh, presentation of 1 to 9, these alpha to theta. And then these are tens, these iota to coppa. And these are in 100. So suppose you want to write 241. So you take 2 from the hundreds case, so that's sigma. And 40 means 4 in the tens case. So that's your mu, so sigma mu, and then one is alpha, and you put a bar on that. That represents the Ionian system, which is, again, a, not a positional system. It's an additive system in nature. So accordingly, you don't need any zero in this system. But uh, the question uh, remains that why these uh, giants of mathematicians and philosophers and geometers, why could not they see the beauty and the advantage of the place value system? But it was not like that. They did see it, but they didn't accept. They knew that zero and a decimal or a sexagesimal system that came to them from Babylon is much advan advantageous for calculation, but they didn't accept it for some uh, philosophical reason. So that reason possibly came out of Aristotelianism, who declared that nature hates vacuum. There is no void. There is no infinity. No zero, no infinity. Everything is finite and natural. And this earth is sitting inside, and all the other seven planets are moving around it in crystalline uh, spherical orbs. And it is God who is moving the last one. And that was a sort of proof of existence of God moving the seventh heaven. And however uh, unacceptable that may sound today, this was accepted by charge at a point of time. And it was with charge for 2,000 years in Europe. And going against Aristotle was almost equivalent to going against charge. So that's how. That's one reason. The other reason was their fascination with geometry. I mean, yesterday also some, in some lecture you heard that everything in Greek uh, mathematics were geometrical. They used to translate everything in figure. Every number for them was a shape, one or more than shape. So they asked the question, if 0 stands for nothing, how can this be represented by some shape? How can, what, after all, what shape can nothing have? And also, 0 messed up the neat Pythagorean doctrine of ratio and harmonics. You cannot take ratio with 0. It destroys your mathematics. 2 is to 0. What will be the fate of this expression? So that's how 0 cannot be tolerated. So actually, these philosophers, they stood the way of 0. They so stood the way of prospering of 0, if, even if the mathematicians wanted. So we see that. We see that uh, this Aristotelianism, as I told you, up to 16th century Europe, this uh, spread through Alexander's conquest and lasted up to 16th century. And there are exceptions. You find this uh, Greek astronomer Ptolemy. Yesterday, we talked about Ptolemy and Theon and uh, his daughter Hypatia. They actually, in the Alexandria, they used the sexagesimal positional system for their private calculation with zero and used alone like our modern zero, but only in the fractional part of the number. Integers were written alphabetically. 
they did the calculation because they knew it is much advantageous to calculate in the sexagesimal place value system, but they recorded their calculation with alphabetic numerals. And at a point of time, this letter Auden stands for nothing. It was proposed that this nothing and this Auden Omicron is the origin of our zero and this is the Greek zero. But later on refuted by the fact that numeral zero in that uh, alphabetic system stands for 70. So somebody proposed, and I found it in R.C. Gupta's uh, uh, article, that that's how they used to have an embellishment over the zero, this kind of this kind of embellishment, you can see over this O is a kind of barbell or dumbbell type of system and you can see some of the papyruses. This is referred to as the Hellenistic zero. But this was not freely used everywhere as you can see, not even, not even by giants like Archimedes. Their largest number they usually used was only mil in the Roman system and myriad in them 10 to the power 4. Of course, the beauty or the greatness of Archimedes is he used to you know, replicate myriads and myriads and myriads and myriads, and that's the famous sand reconner problem. Very large numbers, he talked about that system. But then still, if you look at the depth of that system, you will see that zero is missing. Because in our system, when you replicate, after one lakh, we go up to 100 lakhs, then we start counting from one lakh one. But what Archimedes did was the myriad myriad, the next number was the one, that myriad myriad was equated with one of the next phase. It should be zero of the next phase, should count from the next number, but he started right from that number. That shows the absence of zero in their mind. And that is due to the fact that even Archimedes was almost on the verge of discovering what is known as uh, modern calculus, I mean integral calculus, but he didn't go up to the infinity. He just interpolated some steps and stopped there. In Apostol's book, you can find that fantastic method of exhaustion for finding the area under a parabolic curve to get this statement ratified. And then you come to Rome. Yesterday, Amartya sarcastically mentioned in one of the comments, even Rome, yes, even Rome. Rome was not famous for doing uh, something good to mathematics. I mean, it is said that the most important Roman contribution to mathematics is negative contribution. They killed Archimedes and they killed Hypatia. That's their most important contribution. And these are the Roman numbers that we know is used and very complicated, clumsy system, additive, subtractive, rules are difficult to remember. You see here, is a number larger, 2017, but it requires lesser number of symbols than a smaller number, it requires more. So you write something to the left, it has to be subtracted, but not uniformly, right? X, it's 10, C, that's 100, but this has to be written to represent 90. You cannot simply write X to the left of C and claim 10 is subtracted from C. It's very complicated, and that makes calculation complicated. See, this is a multiplication basically managed by class two students these days, but if you look at the corresponding multiplication of the Romans, this, you have to understand a whole lot of, lot of thing, and then you have to get to the corresponding number in their clumsy representation, and this tells you that if you want to divide, you have to summon uh, Roman mathematicians of that days. So we do get two such words, nulla and nihil, in that particular time representing zero in writing, while this Dionysius Exigus, a monk who was trying to extend this uh, Roman calendar for calculating the uh, uh, Christ's uh, resurrection, so there uh, he used this fusion of Jewish calendar and Roman calendar and gone wrong by a certain number of years to calculate uh, Jesus' birth. And there these words are found, but they didn't have the formal idea of zero, which is quite clear from the next account. After 200 more days, another monk, Bede, he used to extend this calendar both backward and forward. He tried to do something more than he was actually uh, given the task to accomplish. And towards that, this is what he did. He placed 1 BC just immediately after 1 AD. And that's the problem that in exactly which of these years you consider Christ to be born, if you put it by the side of your number line, minus one and plus one, like this, minus one and plus one, you should have a zero in between. The zero year should be the birth year of Christ. But there is no such zero year in our system. And that's how we suffer from the millennium problem every time we get to the year ending with zeros. Like this 2000, if you remember, there was a huge cry all over the world that this is a new millennium. Few mathematicians only trying to tell it's not new, it will be in 2001, otherwise the counting is not matching, but nobody heard to that. But that's, that's, the, that's the reason that we don't have a zero here because they didn't have the idea of zero clearly at that point of time. So then we have come to China, a very recent, uh, relatively recent, I wouldn't say very recent, it's uh, coming from the time of Joseph Needham, there is a claim that uh, origin of this system possibly was in China, as a proposition Needham uh, proposed it, sort of conjecture, then uh, some other scholars like Lamb, 
they have written a book, Fleeting Footsteps, and very recently, Professor Nanda, uh, you know, in the favor of that, trying to write certain things, but they have been criticized by many others. I don't have time to get into the details of this. Marzloff, Maiti, many others, they have shown the uh, gaps of their argument. We expected, I mean, a new book when it was written, personally, I expected as a, as a follower of this whole story. You know, I am not a historian by no means an order. I am just an enthusiast, zero enthusiast. I just try to accumulate whatever I find anywhere uh, I mean, related to zero. So I expected in that book that I'll get some counter arguments of Marzelov and others, but unfortunately, Professor Nanda only repeated what you find in the uh, book of uh, Lang and Ang. So it, it remains where it was at that point of time. Here you see the system. The initial system was this. It's a decimal but multiplicative system in the sense that when you want to write a number like this, you have to use these positional notations. I mean, this she, by queen, these are 10, 100, 1,000, 10,000. So you want to write 79,564. So look at here, 64. It's not just 6 and 4. You have to write 6, 10, 4. Like you, if you remember, in our boyhood days, you used to, used to utter like that, 6 tens are 4 and 64. So that's like thing. 6 tens and 4 are 64. So you have to put that 10 symbol. That was the original found in the oracle bones. And 0, again, is not needed for this system. So this, though decimal, multiplicative additive system, not a clear decimal system that we are in search of. But at a point of time there, this positional decimal system in their counting board evolved. This is called rod numerals, as uh, explained in this book, uh, the counting procedure in great details around this. It was, of course, this procedure is much older than this particular point of time, but in the, this particular book, uh, Lamb has shown that how this counting was done and he has actually proposed to uh, point, uh, point by point to see that how the Arabic books, which got the Hindu Arabic numerals from India, they calculated and their calculation and this calculation, how they match step by step. But certain points are very interesting. You know, in this system, again, first of all, the minimality of the uh, number of symbols is lost. You don't require actually nine because here you, in this system, you write one and two side by side, it will look like three. So to avoid that, they had to use a second series inverted 90 degree to the right, and that's how you need 18 symbols rather than nine, and there is no zero again, and this the same situation with the early Babylon period gap. This gap they used to call Kong, and sometime it was proposed that this Kong was like uh, Indian Shunya, but the thing Marzalov asked is that there is no such example that if you have two such zeros, whether it will be called Kong Kong, or whether it was called like Kong Kong, like it was called Ling Ling when later the symbol entered in their system much later in 8th century called Ling, and then Ling Ling is valid, but there is no example for thing like Kong Kong. There's one of the, one of the reasons Marjilov pointed out against this proposal. There's many other, if you want to, you can share after the talk. So with this, the general, general proposition is this, that this is uh, at point of time with the Buddhist influence going from India to China, this, uh, all these bold dot zero, it uh, traveled there th through the, around, around, uh, around this point of time, Tang Dynasty, and this uh, some Gautama Shiddha around this point of time, who took it there, and you can see this is from Nidham's book. At this time, this is 1303, you find this fantastic picture, and if you can recognize the bamboo rod numerals picture, this is basically what you know as a Pascal triangle, much earlier than Pascal much earlier than Pascal, and believe me, similar Pascal triangle was in India in Pingala's Chanda Sutra, even 1,500 years earlier than that. So we'll come to that if time permits. Uh, Michelle, will you do me a favor? I mean, give me a signal 10 minutes early when I am supposed to stop, right? So, so then, at this point of time, they started using this symbol, as you can see here now, this is 10. This is 1010, is in the expansion. A plus B whole to the power N for the power 1, 2, 3, 4, and the coefficients are written in this so-called Pascal triangle where you see this 10 over there, right? So we come to India now. The main problem with India is its orality. In the sense that historians generally accept documents which are written in some form, somewhere. Oral tradition, it has to, you know, always have to refer to some, somebody who tells that we know it from someone else at some point of time. And that creates a lot of, you know, controversies, trouble, acceptance, and sort of issues, right? So 
this oral transmission, but this was there. It's a fantastic and amazingly lofty philosophical civilization where Shunya was you know, embraced in all, all, all sorts of philosophical schools of doctrines. Shunya, unlike, very unlike Greek philosophical society who actually stood the way of zero, here you will see that all the sages and monks of those days, they were trying to toy with the idea of zero and infinity, simultaneously, sort of dichotomy between nothing and everything. And that actually paved the path, as it is believed by some scholars, that when the time came in the society, when exactly we don't know, but when the time came for the mathematicians to propose a symbol for nothingness, zero, it was ratified by the whole society without going against this idea. So here, when we talk about uh, uh, India, I mean, this is not the current uh, India that we refer to. This is the whole subcontinent. Uh, with reference to that, we are talking here. And you see, this is uh, a very well-known verse, Jatha Shikha Moviranang Naganang Manoyo Jatha. I mean, it tells the high place, the esteem that was placed to the mathematics in this particular society. This is ICM 2000 poster. And with reference to this Vedanga, six limbs of Veda, this is in the Vedanga Jyotish. One, uh, two particular Vedangas, Vyakarana and Jyotish, has, uh, I mean, Chanda has to play a very important role in the discussion of zero. I'll, uh, I'll just try to touch upon, if we can, I mean, this is the philosophical backbone, some of the, some of the crisps that we can share. You start with the Ishopanisha, the, the uh, you know, Shanti Patha, which tells that Purnasya, Purnamadaya, Purnameva Vashishyate. Here again, you see, if it's a philosophical statement. Don't misunderstand me. I'm not ever proposing that this is a mathematical rule. No. No mathematics. It's purely philosophy. But the philosophy is supporting, at a point of time, when you look at it from a mathematical perspective, that this Purna, if you call it as infinite, then it tells that from an infinite collection, if you take away infinite things, it still remains infinite, which is a very, very true statement for infinite sets. And the Purna, if you look at it as a zero, then zero minus zero is also zero. Purnasya, Purnamadaya, Purnamevashish. But again, it is not this zero and infinity that is being told by this. It was purely philosophy. But that's what I mean when I say these philosophers were toying with certain ideas of vacuity, vacuum, and infinitude. That when the time came in the society by the mathematicians to propose such a concept mathematically, it was not contested by the philosophers. So similarly, you see this is the Nashwadiya Shukta of Rigveda, where you see the sage is talking about a point of time when the world was not, the sky beyond was neither. In this complete vacuum before creation, who are you there? creating every such thing. So they are toying with the idea of vacuum. As you can see, there's another one, Anoronian Mahato Mahiyan, the way you look at the Brahma, Anoronian, smaller than the smallest, minuter than the minutest, and simultaneously larger than the largest. That's the dichotomy of smallest and the largest present here in this kind of philosophical thoughts. And there, you know, Maitrayanu Upanishad, you see God is being referred as Esha, Shuddha, Shunna, Shanta. So Shunna is referred to God there. Maya or the void of Vedanta philosophy, Abhava, the absence in the Naya system, Nishkala Shiva, the partless, formless emancipation of the god Shiva, the creator, and the destroyer simultaneously in Tantra. And you find Madhamaka school of Mahayan Buddhist doctrine, they're talking about the Shunyata, Shunyata Shaptati of Nagarjuna, the, the, the famous Shunyavad, the doctrine of nothingness in 200 CE, their Chatushkoti Binir Mukta, where you see they are proposing that attaining the concept of complete shunyata in oneself is equivalent to nirvana. And this is considered as the pragna paramita, the highest form of knowledge. And how to attain this complete idea of shunyata in oneself? Another philosopher, Nagashena, he proposes that you look at something and step by step, stepwise negate the parts of them. Very similar mathematically, the way you teach the concept of zero to a child these days, that you have two pens, give one to me, how many do you have? One, now give that to me, how many do you have now? Now if you want an answer affirmative in language, you will say I don't have anything, but that's, no, that's not what I want. I want it in number, then this is the number you want. That's how we teach zero to. And this similar philosophical aspect was in the Nagashena's argument of step by step, stepwise negating. You look at a, a chariot, then you look at the top this uh, umbrella of the chariot, negate it, assume that it's not there. Then think of the, uh, I mean, the, uh, the body of the chariot maybe, or the charioteer himself, step by step, negate, and try to attain the complete sense of shunyata. Somehow this, he explained this idea of devoidness. So these are certain philosophical schools who talked about the nothingness of vacuity, 
and then you have the decimal nomenclature. So you know, this is age old in Rig Veda. Uh, Professor Dibakaran is here, it's a fantastic paper. He has given many, many examples from Rig Veda, the astonishingly reach in the words and phrases related to numbers. And why this decimal was chosen, if you go to Yashka's Nirukta etymology, he tells that Dasha Dashata Drishtarthava, which stands for this, uh, this 10 is so close, Dasha is so called because it closes off a sequence of numbers of nine numerals, and it affects, can be seen in forming the next sequence. In Rig Veda, you have this Eka, D, 3, Chatura, to this kind of ayuta and then some other references as well, but they are a bit contested. You have better examples from Rig Veda, Shapta, Shatani, Vingshati, Shahasrani, Shatadasha, and more and more and more. I don't have time to get into all details there. Amartya in a paper beautifully said that to arrive at a written decimal notation from above terminology, one has to simply suppress the place names from given numerical expression, provided one has an additional 10th numeral as a placeholder. You know, in the language of algebra, if you look at a polynomial like 2x cubed plus 3x squared plus 4x plus 5, in algebra, if you are accustomed with what I'm talking about in ring theory, you can look at it as a polynomial or you can look at it as a sort of, you know, quadruple, just writing the coefficients, 2 comma 3 comma something. So suppose you have 2x cubed plus 3x plus 0. Now in this representation, you don't require 0, but when you want to write it the other way, then 2, you need a 0 to represent the absence of x squared. So that's how, that's how this is very similar to this formation, the word names of grammar and the number names in decimal system in Sanskrit was so formulated that you suppress the place names, you get the representation of the numbers, and only you have a filler to fill this zero, zero place, the place of absence. And you see this uh, in our Mahabharata, you have this reference to Nava Yoga Ganana Meti Shashat. So nine is the perpetual number for counting. And then you have these uh, higher powers of 10. There's a penchant for larger numbers in India. In all the, all the uh, I, I mean, all the schools of philosophical thoughts, not only in Hindu, you find them in Buddha's Lalita Vistara, you find them in Jaina uh, context, very large numbers, very large number, counting up to 10 to the power 421, this Tallakshana 10 to the power 53, and this is in Lalita Vistara, the Buddhist text, then Amala Shiddhi of Jaina, that goes to Dasha Ananta, which is 10 to the power 96, here you find in Medhatithi, Shukla Yajurved, 10 to the power 12. So there's a penchant for these higher numbers in decimal place system. The place value reference in non-mathematical work, you find this earliest reference known is the first century C in some Vadanta, Boshumitra, where he, in the Madhamic school, he talks about the dharmas, dharma not in the sense of religion, dharma in the sense of elements of factors, which he ex described by this, Shalakshana Dharanath Dharma. So there, with respect to the change of state, otherness of state, abasthantaraha, so he uh, stated this like a marker or bartika in reckoning which in the unit position has the value of unit, hundreds position that of hundred and thousands position that of a thousand. This translation is by David Rueg. Uh, you can find it in an uh, article by Fritz Stahl uh, there and many others, I mean in uh, many, many other uh, corresponding papers. A very similar one find, you can find in 7th century, so quite, quite after some time. Jataika rekha shatasthane shatam dashasthane dashaika chaikasthane. So same number, same stroke rekha. In one's unit place it represents one, in tens place it represents ten, in hundreds place it represents hundreds. So clearly tells their idea, clear idea of decimal place value system at that point of time. And then non-mathematical roots of shunya, there this is Chanda Sutra uh, Prasadi or Prasadi by Pring Pingala, and there is a book of 310 sutras across eight chapters, and in the eighth chapter he is doing, uh, I mean, excellent mathematics, amazing mathematics in that chapter, doing these kind of things. If you want details, you can have it in the Van Newton's paper, this binary to decimal, decimal to binary conversion. This decimal system is usually ascribed to a, uh, Leibniz, which is uh, more than 1,000 years after, I mean, almost 2,000 years after, and then uh, you have Pascal Triangle and a clear reference to mathematical zero as shunya in a combinatorial calculation in 29 and 30, these two sutras, rupe shunyam and di shunne. And of course, of course, these two shunya were not actually taking part in that mathematical calculation. It's a combinatorial calculation, which you can see basically is nothing from today's perspective. There are seven places left, suppose, and each place can be filled up by two ways, either a laghu or a guru shwar. How many ways you can do that? 
we can easily say now it's 2 to the power 7 but this algorithm actually tells how it's to attain for any n and for this four sutras was given and two of them have this idea of zero rupe shunyam and vi shunne but this zero is used here as a sort of marker and some people criticizes that well this is not taking part in the actual calculation so this cannot be a mathematical zero but once uh, there's another way of looking at it there's a whole mathematical calculation the marker could have been an elephant and a horse he could have told that you draw a horse here and draw an elephant here and where you see elephant do this where you see a horse do that but he didn't he didn't he talked about in the whole mathematical computation he's talking about d and shunya so if everything is mathematical along with the idea of d why don't this shunya should be the idea of a mathematical shunya as well of course he didn't write it up so we don't know what symbol he has in mind what is the idea of his uh, actual uh, shape of that shunya that we don't know and then you have a tacit uh, presence of uh, grammar of panini even even farther back fifth century at least and there you have the idea of lopa adarshanam lopa this is very very technical but there are fantastic books and papers written on it you can try to see lopa stands for you know vanishing of a middle morpheme of a number of of a grammatical word panini while structurizing the grammar he was in a minimalistic approach trying to make minimal number of sutras so that he can accommodate maximum number of available words he was not ready to discard certain word because it doesn't fit in the system rather he was ready to expand the system in such a way the structure of the system in such a mathematical manner that maximum of the words can be accommodated in that system and towards that this a uh, lopa and there are others uh, anubritti and itsanga and it's fairly technical i'm not getting into that but uh, you know there is reason to believe and experts say that of course a grammarian at that stage he is not writing a book on mathematics it's a purely grammar book ostadhai and a grammarian with such a ease is doing this kind of thing maybe mathematicians took the idea from him or maybe he took the idea from mathematicians this is akin to the idea of placeholder zero that we see today so then uh the indian zero chidram kham iti uktam the earliest reference and then you have a reference in atharva veda as kudra this kudra appears in a sloka before you know uh, the idea of one prathame vaswaha it starts with paryayike vaswaha the things that appear one by one paryayike vaswaha then you have a kudra vaswaha at the beginning and very interestingly when it ends prithak sahasra vaswaha and then comes back kudra vaswaha once again so you see the dichotomy at the beginning and at the end the smallest and the largest and then you have this hemachandra with this idea of bindu uh, which is uh, interpreted as bindu at this point of time the use of zero symbol here 60 referred to as sat bindu jutani and shat kha jutani in 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 fujidhaza's work of yavana jataka loko vibhaga is a famous book due to ifra where he has shown that this book was actually ended on this particular day from cosmological calculation backward calculation he calculated this day for 458 ce with word numerals the bhuta shankha and then you have aryabhata who used this kha to denote zero in tandem with his decimal place value system aryabhata has been talked about yesterday the intricate mathematical calculation that he has done in his kadapa the system was not possible unless he was using this idea of zero and a place value system and clear enunciation of place value system you can see in aryabhata ekam dasa cha satam sahasram ayuto niyute and so on so on up to sthana sthanam dasa gunam sat from one place to other it takes multiple of 10 and then you have brahmagupta clearly enunciating the principle that dhanar dhanam you took two uh, positive terms and you add you get a positive term rinam rinayor negative terms add to negative dhana rinayor antaram positive term and negative term numbers they add to antaram the subtraction and finally shamai ke kham this tells clearly x minus x is equals to 0 the first formal enunciation of this mathematical principle that zero is a number in its own right we do have this enunciation here but that's not good enough to claim that this is the first time people came to know about it that that's not the same thing so enunciation is first in brahmagupta's work and then these are certain examples of loko vibhago where you find this uh, you know uh, the idea of uh, bhuta shankha or word numeral and then a classical example is this there you find this word purna rashaguna purna mahishama shakonripa samaye bhavat mamatpatti bhaskara 2 is telling that he was born in 1036 rasha guna purna this purna stands for zero rasha 6 guna 3 guna and then purna and this is mohi this is one so this is the shaka era and converted to 
our usual calendar, it's this time, and Rashaguna, Barshena, Maya, Siddhanta, Shiramani, Rachita. So it's a classical example of using this Bhuta Shankha. There's another very important uh, uh, facet here in the Jaina text of 100 BC, this is in Datta, that the product of these two numbers is a number with 29 places or sthana. If you actually take the product of this number by your calculator or computer, you get this number. And if this number has to occupy 29 places, then you see that one place must be ascribed to this zero. So at least at that point of time, this placeholder zero idea was clearly over there. That is being told. And then you have this uh, fantastic Khahara principle. I'm afraid I don't have time to get into that. Vashkara too proposed this idea of Khahara, division by zero, which was, Till few days back, considered to be completely wrong in the light of calculus. But Avinash Sathe and Amartya, they showed that this is a new algebraic description using the concept of idempotence, a complete new structure. It's not a field as such. But R with the idea of Khaguna and Khahara, as Bhaskara too interpreted, give rise to a new system of its new rule of games. And in that rule of game, the last sum of the Lilavati and the two sums of Bijaganita, which till that was considered to be wrongly done by Vashkara, now has a clear understanding and interpretation. And it's fantastic to know that Ramanujan, when talked to Mahalan Abish, used to tell something philosophically, not in this language, philosophically, myriad manifestation of infinite. He told something to uh, Mahalan Abish, which he recorded in his biography, that I never understood and nobody else could ever. But this uh, statement, mathematically, that zero into infinity is not a single number, but it is a myriad manifestation of the all real numbers. This comes to be true from this idea of Vashkara too, if you accept Shathe's definition. That's something splendid, really. And then uh, you have this idea of form or shape, what Shunya could have been look like at that point of time. It looked like Bindu. In Vashavadatta, it's referred to as Shunya Bindu, and then you have many other references, and then the most, uh, I mean, yeah third or seventh or tenth, we don't know. This is uh, common and very present, uh, very important though, because we have this dot zero in this Bakshali manuscript, and this uh, Barchbach manuscript is in Bodleian libraries. Very recently, it is uh, dated by radiocarbon, and the people who did it, they claim that this is uh, these three folios are dated in this particular. Very interesting, because this was something uh, akin to what uh, Datta and Singh wanted Bakshali to be. This is somewhat similar with Hayashi, and this is uh, close to what Kae wanted it to be. And they, as if, pleased all of them, giving one to each. But uh, in a very recent paper, uh, Plofker and others, they have uh, criticized this uh, a bit, a bit uh, I mean, uh, harshly, allow me to say that, uh, that this is historically absurd, which I don't believe. I think the way they have explained it there's another way of looking at it. I'll just take two minutes to uh, give to that. You see, one of their very important uh, point is this. Folio 16 and 17 consecutive pages, they continue with the same sum. There's a sum on allegation, purity of gold mixture, right? And folio 16 shows this uh, age and folio 17 is this. How is it possible? That is one of their objections. One of the certain objections they have raised now, you see, usually these things were written at a certain point of time by scribes rewritten for preservation. What if this particular, you know, look at the colophon of the Bakshali, it says that it has to be preserved for the descendants. This king of the calculator is written for Vashishta's son and his descendants. So what if this uh, particular object, I mean, not the knowledge is to be preserved only, perhaps this object became an important object for the family, a pre precious family tradition handed over from one generation to another generation, at a certain point of time, some leaves were mutilated and they decided to replace it like something called a restoration work. Suppose a Vinci picture is now gone wrong somewhere, you have to restore it. Of course, today's uh, experts, they don't draw things like Vinci used to draw. They don't belong to the same school. But if they have to recover that Vinci drawing, they will try to be close to Vinci as far as possible. So could it be the case that this 17th folio was just replicated by some expert like a calligraphy? Just, just not, not taking into account the 500 years that has passed by, the grammar, the handwriting that might have changed. This was just an honest copy, pictorial copy of what it was. Possibly could it be, I mean, one aspect they have very uh, elaborately seen and objected to, that why these three are different. But the other aspect, I mean, there is scope to see to that uh, how we can accommodate these data. Hayashi pointed a particular place of Bakshali where it's a different kind of handwriting. Is it possible that that point of time, which, which actually 
uh, pertains to this third folio 33 in the part of X by, uh, marked by Hayashi. Maybe further down in the time, there were not such uh, crafty people who could actually imitate that writing and that's how the handwriting is different. And they did only three. We don't know why three. They actually took five. Two of them are preserved. I don't know why. Why they are not dating it page by page, every page of it. I mean, all these are questions that are to be answered and this will be done. We only hope because unfortunately this is not, is another very unfortunate thing that we don't have this in India. Okay, I'll, I'll, I'll just uh, conclude with this is a bold dot zero found by Amir Excel second time. I mean, initially it was by a French archaeologist, then it was lost in Pol Pot's time of Cambodia, then 2013 he found this and written a book on that, fantastic book, and these are the Nanaghat inscription of uh, Divakaran, Professor Divakaran was talking about the additive number. Not every number in ancient India was place value. This was very much additive, 10 and 7. And we had others, Karashti and uh, this one? This is, this is 605. Shaka era reached the year 605 on fifth day of the warning moon. And Shaka era, if you give this correction, it's 683. And there are many, many, many more, these dotted zeros. And then you have this Nanaghat inscription. This is the general uh, accepted uh, change, gradual change of these numerals, right from Brahmi to the modern. And this is the Gwalior temple where you have this uh, written zero, this accepted generally by all, but of course, Indian scholar, I mean scholars, I won't say Indian, belonging to the Indian school of thoughts or believing in the Indian origin of the modern zero, they do place many other such things like I mean, Michelle recently have written on that. There are so many other options. Even there is a place in Gujarat, the Sankheda Charter. You have a long list in Tifra's book of similar such things. And I'd like to just end with this journey is continuing with this new foundation that was made in, uh, uh, in the year 2016. Its uh, headquarter is in uh, Amsterdam. And there are people who are looking for fresh research on zero. It's a fantastic name they have given, Zero Origin India. So the journey is on. And thank you for bearing me for such a long time. <laughs>